Exactly where he was when he told me, because yeah. that that particular neighborhood in that area was sort of like, uh, well, our stomping grounds down that way. Anyway, uh, we used to like hang out hanging out on the west side, and he was on the west side of town, right on the boulevard. You know, not too far from McGraw, not too far. From, and we had a little joint. We was going to little Cunningham Kinsel's drugstore. We was going to eat. French fries and hamburgers, so I knew that area real well. So when he gave me the number, I just, you know, that Trinity 133040, I said, okay, if I ever need you, I'll call you. So uh, I left, and uh, like I said, after the group, uh, after I left the group and split up, I was real disheartened, didn't know what I was going to do, and then one day I I came home, bought, had just bought me a new car, because I had saved my money on the road, I saved my money, bought me a new car, new Plymouth, boy, a new Christ, I was riding around, everybody knew I was home, and there was a guy, his name was George Ross, George Miller. George Miller Ross. His name was Miller and his mother's name was Ross, so he used both names. And he and I had sang together in the 50s uh, with, a, with a little doo-wop group. Not nothing really professional, but um, we used to get together and we'd sing and we'd blow harmonies and we'd be around little parties and stuff. And he was a real good tenor. And... Um, he came by my house, and uh, him and a couple guys came by my house one day. He said, talked to me and said he got a couple boys and he wanted, had a little group he was trying to put together. And would I would I come and sing? And I said, Nah, I ain't doing no more singing. So I'm not singing for a while. I'm gonna do something else. And. Uh, so we talked about it, and I said, nah, I don't think so. Plus, I didn't like the way the guys looked. They just looked like they couldn't sing. <laughs> so I said, no, nah, I don't, no, George, I don't think so. Well, I laid around there for a while. He said, well, he said, we're going to come back again. Talk to you later on. Maybe you change your mind. So I was laying around, and back in uh, the late 50s, in the early 60s, it was a radio station that all black people listened to, especially when there wasn't a lot of radio stations in cities at that time, a lot of cities, especially in the north, had no black radio stations. You know, in the south, yeah. you know, blacks might have had a black radio station, but in the north where everything was equal, we didn't just have no, we listened to the radio. Right. So we would always listen to it on the on the white radio station. Uh, whoever the black MC was or disc jockey was had about two or four hours on the radio mm -hmm. to play music, whatever it was. So late at night, especially in the evening when traffic had settled down, there was a station we used to get out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it was called... WLAC, Nashville, Tennessee. Right. It was actually in Gallatin, but they call it Nashville, Tennessee. And it was a place called Randy's Record. Records. Mark. Uh, yeah. Randy's no matter where Record you live, you got that. <laughs> and, it, and it was a big station that went all over the country. Uh -huh. 
And we got it up north, right. especially it was at night when wasn't no traffic, no interference. And we used to lay around, and I used to go upstairs at night, especially, you know, in the evening around 7 o'clock and just turn on the radio and listen. You know, when I got tired of hearing uh, Tex Ritter <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, Frankie Lane and... <laughs> Teresa Brewer. Hey, that's my wife's cousin, Teresa Brewer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Patty Page. When I got tired of hearing them and during the day, I would go upstairs and, you know, and turn on the radio and try to get WLAC, Nashville, Tennessee. And it, and I used to just, you know, lay down for hours and just listen, you know, because you would hear all the top music in the country coming out of there. And I was listening, and he was playing all kind of records. And I heard, if you've ever, ever been jilted, I heard that. Yeah. And it sounded good. Now, and then one night I was standing there listening, and I heard Gene Nobles. So I got a brand new record from old Tennessee boy. I'm getting ready to play it in just a minute. A boy named William Bell got him a new record. <laughs> new record just been released. And buddy, I guarantee you it's going to be a big hit. And after the little commercial, he came on and he played You Don't Miss Your Water Till the Well Run Dry. And he said, Oops, I just missed my water. All right. <laughs> <laughs> And I laid there, and I laid there and heard that boy singing that you don't miss your water. Too well, run dry. And I said, oh, man. I quit a couple weeks too soon. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I think that if we had stayed together, we might not have even did. I don't know. But I laid there and I listened to you don't miss your water by William Bell. I got sick as a dog. <laughs> I said, Lord, that verse. Something happened. And I was listening. Like I said, I heard jilted. And uh, so a couple of days later, George came back to the house, knocked on the door. And I'm talking to him, man. Talk to you, man. About that group. We still got the group. So I said, well, man, let me tell you this. I said, my priorities have changed a little bit, George, and I, things we used to do, I can't do them. You know, we used to sing. I said, I have no desire to get together with a group just to sing and go around to parties and do something for the fun of it or just to be as nice to do. I said, but I've been out on the road and I've been, I've made money in it. I've been singing professionally, and, and my heart just ain't in that no more, of going around singing. Really? He said, well, that's the reason why I want you to sing with us, because I know you've been out there on the road, you know the, you know the ropes, and, 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 and you'll be good, and you'll be good for us. I said, well, let me tell you this. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to, I said, we'll try it out. I said, and when we come in, I'm going to come to practice and rehearse with you guys once. And at that first meeting, if I don't think you got the potential to be in a, a good group, then I ain't coming back no more. I'm letting you know right now. If you don't sound like nothing, I ain't coming back. Don't come back and bother me. So we got together and did a little rehearsing and uh, they didn't sound half bad. He was, uh, <clears throat> um, there was a, a guy named James who was the bass and uh, Lee Moore was a second tenor and George was a first tenor or a second tenor or a false tenor. He could sing anything because he could sing the false note and myself and and uh, we got together and uh, started singing, started going over some some popular songs that was already out doing some things. And 
I was singing lead on something. They didn't sound too bad, but it was something about the tone of Lee Moore's voice that I didn't like. And I don't know if it was because <laughs> I never heard nobody singing with a southern accent, but he was about Mississippi. <laughs> and, like, and you'd be saying, ooh, and he'd be saying, ooh, <laughs> or something. So I decided, I said, well, man, now, why don't you? What songs do you know? And uh, he starts, so you sing. And so when he started singing, and me and George started blowing harmony in the background, beautiful blend. So I said, well, you go on and lead the song. And uh, so he started leading, and me and George and James. George was like a baritone bass. Well, he was actually a good bass. And uh, me and George sung the two tenors in the background. Sound pretty, fairly decent. Sound fairly decent. So we did that a couple of times. So I said, well, we got, I said, well, I got a couple of original things that, that I'd like to work on. And then uh, the other guy said, well, I got a couple, too, that I had written and stuff like that. I said, well, okay. I said, we, okay. I agree that we can blow a little harmony together, but I don't have no intentions to sing nobody else's songs right now. What I want to do is concentrate on the little three or four tunes that we got. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I got somebody who's willing to listen to us from the record company. I say, so let's work on them. So we did. We put, uh, like maybe three or four songs together and we just started rehearsing on them but we would sing somebody else's song to warm up or open up we would do Gladys Knight and the Pips who had just started back then it was before their Motown days when they were we would sing a couple of things by Gladys Knight and the Pips so actually only with the group that I was with I could only sing songs like Twist and Shout yeah. or Ooh Poop or Do or something like that because it wouldn't require a beautiful harmony in the back which Lee Moore didn't have. Right. You know, but the shouting type stuff he could do. Yeah. You know, sing background on. So when it comes to singing uh, some Isley Brothers or some or some Huey Smith or something like that. Uh, I would do the lead on it because I was. Uh, they thought I was a pretty good lead singer. Something that he didn't have to blow no harmony on. But other than that, I would let him do the leading and I would do the tenor. So we got together a couple of times and we rehearsed on like three or four songs and got them to where we where I thought they were good enough. And I called Barry Gordy in Detroit. And uh, told him who I was and reminded him, oh, yeah, I remember you, man. Yeah. Say, well, you got something when you want to come over and see me. Then you could walk in and see Barry face to face. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, come on over Tuesday and we'll, we'll take a listen. So the Tuesday that we got ready to go, that boy James couldn't go. His wife wouldn't let him go or something. Or he had the babysit. And that was some of the things that I didn't want to be bothered with. Right. Because I knew that anytime he sang. And so we went over. So I said, well, we're going anyway with just us three. Yeah. So we went over there with just us three. And we sang a couple of the songs. And, uh, and Barry listened and. He said, Ugh. he said, okay. He said, I like this. I like two of those. And he said, um, and three potentials. But um, he said, okay. He said, I like them. We'll do something with them. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, give me a call next week, and I'll have some contracts drawn up. And he said, we'll sign you for us to a contract. But we just ain't, he said, but at this time, we won't go in the studio and do no recording. So we'll do some recording later on. And uh, I said, okay. But really, it wasn't okay. Yeah. Because I didn't like that. So he said, so what we did, so we went back. So we left and drove back to Toledo, which 
which was only a 45 minute drive, you know, from Toledo to Detroit. So we came back and I said, no man, we're going we're gonna to do something better than this. I said, we got to have some gimmicks. We got to have some stuff. We got to do some you stuff. You was totally so impressed with you. All right. You know, he liked the song yeah, because he had, and at that particular time, I didn't, I didn't know why he liked the song. <laughs> That's because he had Joe Bat Publishing Company, <laughs> and he could get the publishing yeah. and own the publishing to <laughs> the song. And I didn't know that at the time. But we had, and we did have some good songs, some good R&B yeah. material. And it would have been worth recording, and it would have did all right. But when we got back home, I said, no, we're going to do something. And I said, I heard Barry talk many days. And I heard what he said to us. So I went and doctored up a song coming to my palace. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, just explained to them how we was going to do it. I said, what we're going to do is that, and it was real funny to Lee. He just, he laughed. I mean, they liked it. You know, he laughed like he was listening to the coasters saying, run, red, run, because he's got your gun. When I, when I told him what I was going to do, I said, what we're going to do is that I'm going to put a little, introduce a little bass on the beginning of the song. And then on my breaks, you get, you and George come in with the double lead, and then I'll join you later. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, let me show you what I'm talking about. I said, I'll start off like this. Instead of you coming and singing, come into my palace, I'm going to put, like, I say, you remember the Marcel singing Blue Moon? He said, yeah. I said, you remember that bass he had on it? I said, yep. He said, yeah. I said, you know the new song I'll call Duke of Earl? He said, yeah. I said, well, you know, something like that. Just put a little gimmick on the front of the song. There you go. So I come in, I said, let me show you what I'm talking about. I said, I got a little thing. I said, I used to listen to Frankie Lyman and do some little things on, on that bass, too. So I said, I'm going to do like this. I said, I'm going to start off going, bom, 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 mack a sack a sack, come right back to the palace, my love, bom, bom. And then you guys come in and repeat after me mm -hmm. the same thing I said, but in harmony. And then y'all repeat it, and then we go into the verse. He said, okay. So we did that. And then they came and said, ah, oh, yeah, man, that's nice. Then we're going to do breaks. And then, so I said, okay, so we did, we put the song together. We put the song together. We rehearsed on it all that day and all the next day. And I called Barry Gordy back. I called Barry Gordy back. I said, Barry, I got it. I got something. He said, when, when are you going to come? I said, I'm coming right today, tomorrow. He said, come tomorrow. I said, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. I said, I got something. I said, I got something new. Well, it was the same song. I just had doctored it up. I had doctored it up a little bit. So when we went in, I called him. He said, come in the next day. So we went in the next day. And the next day when I went in, he said, okay, let me hear what you got. And I said, bom, 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 mack a sack, sack, come right back. And they came in and started saying, he said, wait a minute, hold, 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 hold. He said, do that again. Do that again. <laughs> so <clears throat> I did it again. And then he said, wait a minute, hold it. And he went and got Mickey Stevens, Mickey Stevenson and Hank Cosby. He said, hey, you guys, come in here. Bring a pad. Bring a pad and a pencil. And, uh, and so uh, he said, now y'all sing it and sing it all the way through. So we start singing. Oh, and uh, and as we were singing, Hank Cosby was writing the notes and the changes down on a pad and a piece of paper. And uh, and Barry said, we can record this tomorrow. He said, we're recording tomorrow. Hank, get the musicians together. We're recording tomorrow. He said, I have Miss, I have Miss Edwards draw up the contract. <laughs> Miss Edwards had a contract ready for you. 
So the rest is the rest is Motown history. Turn it up a little bit. Let me hear that. This is the first first big release and hit on Gordy Lay. Catching my breath doing the tenor and the bass at the same time. Yeah. I could do it on stage or I could do what we're doing, but on the recording, the recording had to be right. Mm -hmm. So he called, so he got Eddie to sing that the, the tenor on the record. Did, did you know uh, Eddie by that time? Did, did you know uh, Eddie by that time? Yeah, by that time I know I, I knew Eddie Kendrick. Well, now after Barry recorded uh, this, uh, what happened then? Because uh, that record came out on two different labels. Yeah, but it was a it was a lot later that it came out on the other label. It was that next like that next year or later on when Barry when Barry first did the song and released it I don't think he was really prepared for the record to be a pop record I don't think he knew what to do at that particular time when the record came out see it's a lot it's a lot of facets to my life that I had not talked about as of yet but throughout my years of singing and being around, I had met a lot of people and had done a lot of things. So when the day that Barry was going to release the record, I asked Barry to give me a box. And at that, those days, records came in boxes of 25. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a box of 25. And... Uh, when we left Motown that particular day, after we had recorded and everything, and did everything, and um, got back home, the boy who used to sing with us, James, who did not make the trip, found out he was X'd out. Because Barry was ready to sign us three, right. as it was. So, um, it took about two weeks for Barry to get it pressed. You know, after us recording. That's quick, though. Oh, he did it real quick. Yeah. He was ready to go on the street with it right then. He sent it to the press, got it pressed up, and we came back in and listened. And we listened. Boy. Um, um, Brian Holland had did a great job of mixing and everything. Because he stayed in the studio. As a matter of fact, I thought he had a bed and a pillow. Because every time he was, done, he was there mixing, doing a lot of mixing. And when we heard it on the 45, it sounded good. So we were ready to go back. We came on the release date, and I asked him for a box of 25. Well, at that particular time, when he gave me a box of 25, we headed back toward Toledo. And I told Lee who was driving, I said, take me to WOHO. And I had, I had known the program director who was on the air at that time. He was the daytime jock and the program director. 
His name was Fred Mitchell. He had a program called Hitch with Mitch. And he and he played the top songs in the country. And which was one of the reasons why George and Lee wanted to hook up with me in the beginning. I had a lot of outlets and knew a lot of people. And I walked in the station with the record. And Fred Mitchell had known me, <laughs> which I didn't talk about, from being with another little group around Toledo. We used to play at a lot of his, he used to give big record hops. Mm -hmm. And one of the big attractions at all the record hops that all the white kids did and all the jocks were to have some of the top black performers come. Because yeah. all the kids would come right. to see the performances. Yeah. So what he did is that he would always, and I was with a, you know, Although I had been with the Del Rios, I also, in, when I was in and out of town, I used to do some things with a, a group at that time, which they called themselves the Gay Hawks. And there was a guitar player named Bobby Smith, keyboard player named Leo Darrington, and a drummer named Earl Wilson. And we used to go around to a lot of the clubs and play. And it was a place he called the Pink Palace on the east side where he used to hold record hops and also he used to use a big place called the sports arena where they paid all the big acts and we used to play a lot of those clubs and he used to, and he dubbed me Mr. New Orleans because at that time Gary U.S. Bonds had had a record out called New Orleans right and that was when we did a lot of songs and that was one of the ones that I always get requests to do. And I did it. And I mean, I really did it. So he, he liked me. So when I walked in the studio and asked the secretary if I could see Fred Mitchell, she said, he's on the air. And I said, can I wait till you have a break? And he stuck his head out the door and saw me. Because he, and, 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 uh, he was taking a break. So he told me to come on back. And I went back and... Uh, told him, you know, what I had. And I told him I, I, we had just recorded a record up in Detroit for Barry Gordy. And uh, I really didn't say Motown because Motown had no impact yeah. on anybody at that time. So I just said we were just recorded a record in Detroit for Barry Gordy. And I said, you know Barry Gordy, he got a group called The Miracles and a girl called Mary Wells. He said, oh yeah. So um, so he asked me right then and there. He said, what you guys doing this weekend or next weekend? He said, you would, you you available for record house? I said, yeah, Mitch, you know that. He said, okay, good. He said, okay. And I said, here's my phone number, call me. And he said, okay, I will. And uh, as we were going out to, and so he told me that he'd get back with me. And so evidently, he put it on while I was walking out the door in his office and just listened to the beginning of it. Yeah. So, so we, I jumped, so when we got back in the car, we had the radio tuned to WHO because it was only two stations yeah. that played what we call at that time, played rock and roll. And that was WOHO and WTOD. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rest of the radio stations played classical music and pop and, and, pop and country music and stuff like that. But they were the only ones that played. So we had it tuned to WHO. So as we were pulling out the driveway, Mitch got through playing that record and he came on the air. And he said, and he came on the air and said, Woo! He said, just a few minutes ago, he said, a young man named Prentice Anderson just walked out of my studio. And he said, a lot of you who in this listening area know him he's with a group now called Lee and the Leopards he said he just handed me a jewel a gem he said something that's gonna knock your socks off he said believe me you this is gonna be a top record this is gonna be a hit record he said we might can get him to come out to the Pink Palace this weekend he said but right now I'm gonna play for you the brand new record on the Gordy label by Lee and the Leopards called 
come into my palace. And he played it right there. He, yeah. he put it on and listened to it a little bit. Yeah. And all you have to hear is the first... Yeah, the little tag. And you know, got... the first 30 or 40 seconds of the song. And you know that it's an ear catcher. Right. And especially, we're talking about early 60s. Yeah. You know, you're talking about 61, 62. So he put it on and played it right then and there. And then after, uh, right then and there, and then he told him that we'd be, uh, that he was having a big hop and we'd be there. So I also went to WTOD. And uh, and at that time, Barry Gordy, um, he was doing a real strong R&B thing, but he wasn't doing a real strong pop thing at that, at that time. And... Uh, and the only stations we had were pop stations, you know. And uh, so when we went there and, and Fred Mitchell started playing and everybody else, then we went to this guy in Toledo, WTOD. His name was Bob Parkinson. He was the program director. Well, at that particular time, Jackie Mayer from a little town outside of Toledo from Sandusky, Ohio, had just been named Miss America. She was Miss America, 1962. And she was traveling around. And when he played, when he grabbed that record and started playing that record, he did a little promotional thing. And so we started going around with him and Jackie Mayer, because she was doing her little promotional thing. Yeah, right. So we got a chance to, and he loved the record. And, uh, and plus, he was the new kid in the block. Because the big station was W-O-H-O. Mm -hmm. And W-T-O-D was a station that was trying to compete. So he had Jackie Mayer plus us, you know, running with him, traveling with him. So immediately, everybody started listening to W-T-O-D. Because he was a good station, he was playing the record. And we, we went a lot of places with him, you know, just getting record promotions. And then... A couple of the pop stations in Detroit jumped right on uh, WKNR, which is Kena Radio in Detroit. You know, started on it, so we got some. We got a lot of play on the record. You know, around Detroit and around Toledo, and I think it jumped off a little sooner than what Barry was, <laughs> you know, used to. Yeah. You know, because usually, you know. He was getting his records played on, on the right. He those was kind of right. Usually, he would go to the you know you go to the black stations, yeah. get your record, and the black stations would play it, and it would play it, and it become a big hit. And then if it came a big hit on the black stations, also, yeah. then it would cross over, and the white stations might play it one or two times. But this one started <laughs> on the <laughs> white station, <laughs> you know. And then at that, and then Barry wasn't really, he didn't expect it to do that. And then he was really enthused about making the Temptations at that time anyway. And he didn't really think we were going to do that. And he didn't have a lot of time to concentrate on us. So he gave us to Mickey Stevenson, you know, to work with because he had a different project. Everybody had their own little project, yeah. you know. So he gave Mickey Stevenson, Lee and the Leopards, and he had The Temptations. And he had been working on trying to get The Temptations a uh, hit record. And they actually had the first number on Gordy Records, even though yours was released before. Right. Was. They had 701, yeah. and we had 702. Right. Because he went to the press first with their record. Yeah. But would nobody do nothing with it. You know, and it didn't do nothing. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He went to press. You know, the pressing them up. Right. So he pressed it up first. Yeah. But ours was the first, you know. Yours got out first. Right, <laughs> right. So, um, so uh, all the stations started, and then later on it took off so so well and so good that he, he signed a deal with Laurie Records out of New York. Mm-hmm to pick the record up and to handle it and distribute it, which Laurie Records at that time was was, pretty big. was a pretty big, you know, you know, they sent you know, they had Dion and the Belmonts mm -hmm. at that time, Laurie did. And and they were big, Dion and the Belmonts. And uh, 
and then he had Dion the Belmont plus he had Dion himself Dion DiMucci he had him so Laurie Records was known all across the country so we got a chance to sell some more records around New York Philly and you know on the East Coast and places like that can you talk a little bit about uh, I mean you know the Temptations were a big group for Motown early on and no they were not a big group for Motown. Well, they, 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 became, they, they became oh, a big group. Okay. okay, they became a big group. Yeah. Because when we started, when we first started, yeah, he tried, but uh, Barry, you were bullheaded. <laughs> <laughs> but but you had but you had a, a lot of contact with with some of the early members of, of, of the yeah. Temptations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's I used kind to, of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I used to go around to uh, and hang around uh, uh, Eddie and uh, Paul a lot. They came up to uh, Detroit from Birmingham and they had come up to Detroit and uh, they hung around Detroit for a while in early 60s and uh, 59 and 60 and Detroit when they first came was really a cup of tea yeah and uh, so they hung around Detroit for a while and then they left and went to Cleveland they went to Cleveland and stayed in Cleveland for a while, which is how they met uh, the OJs and met uh, uh, the contortionists I was talking about earlier on when I was talking about the Delphians, Caldonia, yeah. who became a, a real big mentor of them because she loved them before everybody else because she was a top-notch entertainer. And uh, you might not remember, but... Louis Jordan. There's a song called Caledonia. Right. Yeah. Had a song line called Caledonia. So Caledonia mm -hmm. was real known. And she was, by that time though, she was old. Yeah. But she was still a dancer. And she could do. So they stayed and uh, went to Cleveland and hung around for a while. Then they came back to Detroit. And uh, I would hang, I was around Eddie and Paul because my mother was also from Alabama. So, um, and they were from Birmingham uh, and I used to you know just go around and hang around and Eddie would sometimes you know we would sit around and we just sing and stuff and do things and they, he would come by the house my mother would you know we I drive to Detroit you know we hang out a little bit and he'd come back to Toledo with me we eat and hang around and do stuff and then sometimes I'd call and talk to his father on the phone, call them, yeah. you know, to let them know that that he was doing all right, oh. you know, because in those days when, you know, people in the South worried about their kids, especially when they left and went to a big city. I know that's right. You know, <laughs> oh, I know you know it's right now because you just took your, you know, parents worried. <laughs> I, I forgot you just sent your son off, but especially in the in those early days yeah. because there was a lot of racial things going on right. and, and um, they, they were leaving Alabama coming to a big city like Detroit that was integrated but they had some problems and you didn't know so I used to call his father Mr. Kendricks and talk to him a lot tell him how they were doing everything was alright and we'd talk and everything so we were so we were pretty tight and uh And then, and, then, um, and uh, it was Eddie, Paul, and Cal. We call him Cal, but it's Cal, actually Cal. They used to hang around and sing a lot. And uh, and Barry Gordy gave an on. Uh, uh, we had a talent show in Detroit, a big talent show. And they knew whoever won the talent show was was gonna supposed to get a contract with Motown Records, Gordy Records, and there were a lot of a lot of people around there trying to sing, trying to get the trying to get that contract because everybody wanted a recording contract. And um, Al, I mean Cal, Eddie, and Paul was, came to sing that night, mm -hmm. along with some other groups, you know, who was trying to get contract. And uh, Otis Williams in the distance was there that night. 
and they had already and oldest them had already had records out. Yeah. But they wanted a contract with Motown. They wanted to record with Motown. Otis Newman, Otis Williams in the distance had a nice record out called Always and one called Come On, which was a real good record. And uh, But for some reason he wanted to be with Motown. He wanted to be with Barry Gordy. I guess because of the miracles and because of Mary Wealth, who had both had big hit records. Yeah, and Motown started happening. Early like days. Well, just just Smokey and the Miracles and uh, Mary Wells, you're talking, because we're talking about 1959 and 60. We're talking about 1960. And at that particular time, now, and then Barry had a, a guy singing for him named Marv Johnson. You might not have heard, he had a lot of big hits, but Barry had him on a label called United Artists label. And he had a couple of big hits. Um, Move Two Mountains. Uh, I love the way you love, and a song called Merry Go Round. They were big hits, which you probably might not have heard in the South, but they were big hits, so people knew who Barry Gordy was. And uh, but anyway, I had a lot of contact with them. So when we came to record, uh, and. Uh, we couldn't do that overdub, and we used Eddie as tenor on coming to my palace. Mm. And they hadn't had a hit yet. No, but Barry had been in the studio recording some stuff on him. No, Barry Gordy had been in the studio. He recorded a couple of things on him, like uh, Romance Without Finance and a song called Oh Mother of Mine. They were on the same record. They were flip side. Did, 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 did they want you to sing with them early on? Or? Well, at that particular time, they had. They had five good singers. As a matter of fact, they had probably the early group of the Temptations was probably the best group ever assembled. I'm talking about anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. The early group of the Temptations. I'm talking about Melvin Franklin, Otis Williams, Elrich Bryan, Paul Williams, and Eddie Kendrick. Elrich Bryan was probably the best tenor with Eddie Kendricks that I ever heard in my life. And that particular group was the original was the Temptations and and they and they could really blow. I mean they could blow harmony. Probably the best group Was that when they were the prime for the prime? I ever heard. Well no, they had switched from the prime. Now he put them together as the Temps. Then the primes were the early groups with Eddie and Paul and Cal. Okay. Uh, and then when he put them together as the Temps, they had a couple of records out, but they could sing really good, but Barry wasn't using the right in instrumentation, I don't think, in the early days. He thought that they could sing so good that the harmony was so beautiful that he wouldn't need to put a lot of instruments behind him. But at that time, the Drifters had just come out using violins mm -hmm. and orchestra and with There Goes My Baby and uh, and Barry was you know trying to record them with three pieces and four pieces and things like that and their harmony was so beautiful he thought that he could do something with them but then too the label that he was using was so ugly it was the ugliest label I had ever seen that Earl Motown? No it was a label called Miracle label simply because he had a group called the Miracles. Barry got a label, and if you ever get across that label, boy, you've run across an heirloom. It was a rec it was a label called Miracle label. It was an ugly black label with silver printing on it. It was ugly, <laughs> and it wasn't very good to look at. So disc jockeys, if they saw it, they'd probably throw it in the stack because it didn't even look good. You know, and the, the uh, Temptation had a song called Romance Without Finance on uh, Old Mother of Mine, which was, a f was the first release that Barry did on them. Uh, and then they did another one called Check Yourself, hey, and, well, uh, the, but which was a, a decent record, but it was still on an ugly black label. 
Let's talk about uh, some of the other um, labels and artists in, in, in Detroit here in a minute, okay?